was on the Tennessee. And Henry on the Tennessee, here's one of those pictures where they would look down, they were really popular. Think about spring. As Union gunboats went downstream, or upstream, this tries to show the fort when they got nearby. You see what happened in spring? You see it? The flood forted. Did I say the flood forted? <laughs> <laughs> the fort flooded. <laughs> the fort flooded and surrendered without firing a shot. Grant all of a sudden got the fort. And then Union gunboats chugged back downriver, then up the Cumberland. And Fort Donaldson is about here on this picture. Donaldson was on the hill and it was a lot harder to take. They actually tried to take it by storm. Here's a watercolor of it. It failed. Then they lay, what do you call it? We surround it and starve about it. Siege. Well, the Confederates, in fact, the general was named Buckner, from, and they called the army before the war the Old Army. He was friends with Grant the Old Army. And Buckner, the Confederate commander here, thought he'd come out and ask Grant for conditions or terms of surrender. I mentioned these once before, but it was really common to say, okay, <laughs> We don't need to kill each other. Buckner, the Confederate, agreed we had lost. We'll just give you the fort, no more shooting, and then we'll walk out. They, 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 it was called parole. Stack our arms and parole. So that'd be conditioned. We don't need to have unnecessary bloodshed. And he thought his friends with the old army, Grant, would agree. Grant not only ignored him, but Grant would make the statement, I will accept nothing. You have to get these two words down. Unconditional surrender. Unconditional surrender. You surrender, and I'll tell you what to do. Now, the thing was, they would surrender because they were out of food, but this would give the North kind of a hero and make Grant legendary, like as this top, no nonsense fire, which in a way it was. But it also fit in with Grant's name. What was Grant's name? Ulysses S. Grant. U. S. Grant. Unconditional surrender, Grant. Nice. And implying that he was going to go fight. By the way, Ulysses Grant's not his name. His name is Hiram Ulysses Grant. But he went to West Point and they wrote down the wrong name and he didn't say anything. Now, there could have been lots of reasons. Partially, he didn't like the name Hiram. But the other reason was they would get foot lockers, and on the foot lockers, there was like a wooden chest, they would carve their initials in it. And think about U.S. Grant, U.S.G., right? What would his real name be on a football game? Uh, 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 he didn't want to be Hug, and so he took U.S. Grant. And this is where we're going to have a weird thing. Two presidents in American history are going to have the middle initial S. That stands for nothing but S. Really, <laughs> yeah, just, that's all just an S. Anyone know the other? True. Harry S. Truman. Now, Ulysses S. Grant, Ulysses S. Grant, everyone called him Sam, but Ulysses, Ulysses S. Grant, you know, he just did that because it made him a single West Point. He stuck with it. Truman's parents named him S, the letter S. So, <laughs> and where are we at here? Oh, and so, after this fell, Union gunboats went up here, and every Confederate man here and here was outflanked. In one failed swoop, they had to retreat, and this is what we have to get. After Fort Henry and Donaldson fell, all of Western Tennessee was in Union hands for the rest of the war. So that means while McClellan is advancing towards Richmond, in fact, they're about ready to have those first battles in the seven days, all of Western Tennessee and almost all of southern Louisiana is in the hands of the United States. It really looks like the war is about to end. And eastern Tennessee is talking about seceding from the Confederacy. It never did, but that should give you an idea of the time. Yes. So this is like, like we're going back. Yeah, I, just, I want to do the west, do the east, and the west. So this is happening at the same time. Okay. Yeah. And that's why when McClellan got to the gates of Richmond, everyone thought the war is over. We won. We've won the war. But as Grant's army marched south, and with steamboats, it took them a long time. They were slowed up, and he got bored because Confederates just retreated. Grant almost certainly was what we would call an alcoholic. Now, he's not an alcoholic like you might think. Most people, when you think of alcoholics, they drink a lot every night. Does that make sense? He wouldn't do that. He could go days without drinking. 
especially when his wife was there. But when he would get bored and, and didn't have anything to do, he would go on what they called a bender. And he would literally drink for four or five days straight. No sleep, just drink. So that was his problem. Once he started, he couldn't stop until literally he was done. And he would stay awake for five days just drinking. That was his problem. He very well could have gone on a bender right about then. We know he went on a couple benders at Vicksburg, which we'll finish up tomorrow. And so, with that, when they got down to the south, this really rugged, hilly area, lots of little streams along a place called Pittsburgh Landing. But there's a little creek called Shiloh. The Confederates had all been massing down here. Grant didn't know. And they totally surprised her. The Battle of Shiloh. The Confederates called it Pittsburgh Landing, but today everybody calls it Shiloh. And there are all these little creeks, and there's hills, and it's really heavily forested. A terrible place to find a battle. Actually, a really pretty area along the river. The Tennessee River is a big, wide river. Right here is a good restaurant called the Catfish Hotel. You never guess what they serve there. Yeah, exactly. And hush puppies. You know what hush puppies are? Basically, you take a big gob of uh, um, a cornmeal, make a dough, a cornbread, and then you deep fat fry it. It's it's just fatty goodness. And so I was there and ordered, and we got it. this might shock you, catfish there. And then they said, do you want some hush poppies? And sure, we'll take an order of hush poppies. She brought a bowl that was bigger than that call. A <laughs> bowl of hush poppies. And just, I mean, I thought the table creaked. And we thought, we wanted a small. And she's like, oh, that is a small burger in Tennessee. It was, and they wouldn't let us leave till we ate them all. But, <laughs> the Confederate commander was Albert Sidney Johnston. He was considered to be the best soldier in the, in the U.S. Army when the war began. Not Lee. It was Albert Sidney Johnson, a Texan, hard-fighting cavalryman. Who knows how good he's going to be? He made a bunch of mistakes in this campaign, but he was the command. And they totally surprised the U.S. Army that morning of April 6th. They had been marching the Confederates for nearly two straight days. And so they attacked just as the sun was coming up, and Union forces were cooking their breakfast, sitting around campfires. In fact, Union forces realized the attack was coming when rabbits and deer started running out of the forest after the pass them. Why? Because 40,000 Confederates were pushing all the animals in front. This is one of the few times there were an even number of soldiers. The Union had about 40,000 too, and they took them totally by surprise. I mean, literally. They had enough time for just maybe to leave their campfires and grab their muskets, and then screaming out of the woods came 40,000 Confederates, yipping the, <laughs> the rebel yell. And there was just panic. And a few of them grabbed their stuff and took off running, a few isolated spots fought. But one of the things that saved the Union Army is the exhausted, starving Confederates did what? <laughs> Stopped and ate their breakfast and started looting through their tents. And it gave a few isolated pockets of Union soldiers to hold out until reinforcements the tank. Most famously, because of so many bullets whirring around them like a nest of hornets, this is a picture of the hornet's nest, where bullets were whizzing by, and a small group of Confederates held, or sorry, Union soldiers held off for just a couple hours to give time for reinforcements. And just when Johnston was trying to reorganize his men, they were all, they were all um, their units were all messed up because of the terrain and the attack. He was mortally wounded. So we don't know what would have happened. And in the confusion after Johnston was wounded, Grant organizes the fence, got a few men to, or got a few reinforcements, held their line. The next day, the Confederates tried one more attack, couldn't break through, and the Confederates retreated. At the end of the day on the 7th, the Union held the battlefield. Not a big victory but they helped. There were a little over 80,000 men in this valley. So it's not near as big as Antietam or Seven Days or all those, but over 20,000 casualties, even on both sides. That's one out of four men killed, wounded, or missing. This is one of the bloodiest battles in American history. About 20,000, a quarter of all the men. 
little over 20,000. This was just unbelievable how bad this battle was. And Grant's going to be blamed. Rumor started that he was drunk. And Grant is going to be demoted through promotion. Not quite. We're on the right track. Henry Halleck was the overall commander in the West. And so Halleck moved him up to second in command. What does second in command do? And so Halleck, who was a very intelligent man, he was a protege of, remember Old Fuss and Feathers? His nickname was Old Brains. Old Brains. Kind of, it sounds like a Fuss and Feathers in a way, doesn't it? He's by far one of the most important Americans in the Civil War that nobody knows about. None of you have heard of Halleck, have you? Incredibly important. He was slow and cautious. There'd be a month waiting, but I should tell you one quick story. I gotta tell you this. So, I've been to Shiloh. Great, interesting battlefield. And the thing about it is, is the Confederates almost won. And there's a feeling there that they could have won. You know, Johnson would have been wounded, a few other things. And this could have turned the entire course of the war. If you go to a place like Gettysburg, which is the most uh, popular battlefield, battlefield for tourists, it's got a U.S. northern field. There's a northern victory. The second most popular is Shiloh. And Shiloh, Southerners go to. And that's like a place for the lost cause. You know, we almost won. We could have won. Now, this is a great place for could have been. And people are still very pro Confederacy to this day. They go to Shiloh. And I heard about that, but I had no idea. So it's about 2009. And my wife and I went uh, here. I actually went to New Orleans for spring break and then drove up to Mississippi. Out, it was really cold. Up to Memphis and then over to Shiloh. Did you catch the day to Shiloh? It's right at spring break. I, I just lucked out. It was the anniversary. And they had a huge kind of celebration and memorial of this. And we heard it'd be pretty big and they had reenactors. So we thought it'd be a pretty neat, neat place to go. It was unreal how many people were there. Outside the battlefields, they can't do it on the battlefield because this is hollow ground. But they did a reenactment about three miles away. There were over 15,000 reenactors. There were over 20,000 people total who went to the battlefield for that day. They have a huge parking lot because it's such a big national park. That was all blocked up. We had to park miles away and take a shuttle bus in because this was all open for that music. They had um, some men as reenactors firing cannon and muskets, kind of give you an idea of what it was. They had like a hospital set up. This was pretty amazing. And that's where I, I'm pretty sure I lost the hearing in my left ear because I was from about me to that wall and they were firing a cannon. 12 pounder, you know, fired a 12 pound cannonball, but they're just doing the gunpowder shot, not without the cannonball. And I knew black powder is loud. If you ever heard a black powder musket, it's loud, a lot louder than a modern rifle. But I'm like here and I'm just trying to get a good angle. I'm going to take a picture of it and fire. It's the loudest thing I've ever heard in my life. It about knocked me down. My ears were ringing for the rest of the day. It was unreal. We should get one for out there. Yeah. It, black powder is amazing. You ever see like a cannon they have like a like a sporting event, you know, like they do at football games, sometimes they have a cannon and it's not black powder and knock everyone out. But we're there. And there are a couple weird things, but you know, just it's really fun. It's just a beautiful spring day. It's really warm. You know, it's in t-shirts and stuff. But we got there and there were about a thousand, over a thousand people listening to this little band. Um, in Confederate uniforms, kind of a southern bit, but they're playing some war music. It's not, you know, Stand there listening, and there's a whole crowd of people. It's in the parking lot, so there's no cars. We're all in there. And they played a song, got done, and, you know, they were good. It was fun. But they got done and said, um, you know, kind of, all right, all right, everybody. We're here to remember one of the great battles of the Civil War. And everybody started to boo. I mean, boo, like that. And you're going out there, boo. And he goes, no, I mean a great battle of the war between the states. And they also go, yeah, they start cheering and applauding. And then they said, no, I mean the war of northern aggression. And people are like, yes, and they're cheering mad. And then he goes, I mean the war of northern arrogance. And they started hugging each other, and they're high. All of these people, and we're just kind of looking around. 
<laughs> now, those last three terms, they came about in the lost cause, lost cause myth, myth after the Civil War. Nobody called it the war between the states during the war. That came 20 years after the war. To say the war was about states' rights and freedom and not slavery. So this is a, I mean, this is a big deal. This is a political issue they're doing right here. But uh, right as well, I'm like, gee, this is weird. And that's the first time, I mean, there are all these people wearing t-shirts, and a lot of these shirts have the Confederate battle flag and things like that, you know, whatever. But there are a couple of things that really just hit me at that moment. One of them is, I'm just, you're in the South, so we're in New Orleans up to Memphis, and there are people, all kinds of people there, but there are black and white people everywhere. So this is the whole week, and we're just in Memphis that day before. First time since we've been in the South, so we're there this while we're eighth day there. And everybody there was white. That was noticeable. It's like also, oh, this is so much different than what it had just been. And the other thing is all the shirts people were wearing. I mean, it was all that way. And the guy right in front of me had a shirt that had a Confederate, Confederate battle flag, even like the image of Jefferson Davis, remember him? And it said underneath it, we have not forgotten. And then the guy next to me had the South shall rise again. There's another one with the picture of Nathan Bedford Forrest, the great cavalry leader. He also would be the first grand wizard of something called the Ku Klux Klan. He was right there. That real looks me. Well, I mean, this is like, wow. And I look around this, and it got like really weird. One more thing. I was wearing a t-shirt. I could wear t-shirts. And other people had pants and stuff. But <laughs> I like in t-shirts of like, I get like minor league baseball or old football team, like the old like the old uh, logos they would have, and teams like the tournaments. I tried to think those are really cool. This place I have a bunch of them. But I had an old football one. Actually, this was an old NFL one. And it's a team that was, it was the Chicago Cardinals. It said the Chicago Cardinals on it. Now it went to St. Louis and now it's in Arizona. But this is the 1950s, the Chicago Cardinals. It's just a shirt, it's just a t shirt. And so, like this, and it just got, it was just really weird. That's when my wife nudged me and she said, whispering, <laughs> and I was like, oh, gee. <laughs> it just felt really odd. And we start kind of walking back. It's just like, I don't know, you know. And you ever had this feeling that someone's watching you? You know what I mean? So I'm walking back and I can just feel like, God, and I, then I feel like everyone's looking at me. And I turn around and boom, there were three guys right there, right in front of me. There's three guys like this. And Right in front of me, and then all three were a lot shorter, you know, a lot this tall. And they're all like this, and the guy in front of me is just, <laughs> he's mad looking at me. And, I, and I'm literally, gee. <laughs> and he goes, you Yankee. <laughs> and I'm not sure. Chicago, northern town. Didn't even hit me till then. And but my first response was, that. Eh. <laughs> I was so shocked by this. And he goes, no. Are you a Yankee? And I said, I'm from Montana. <laughs> and I could tell, whoosh, he had no idea what Montana was, if there was a state, a river. He's just Montana meant nothing to him. And then he goes, No, are you a Yankee? And I don't know where this came from, but it popped out. Montana wasn't a state yet. <laughs> that, he didn't know what to say then. And this was an exact word. Not word. He just went. <laughs> and then the three of them just stormed off. Now we're all three, four, we're all four close friends. We hang out. But, no, it was the weirdest thing. And when people say to me, you know, I've heard people say, you know, like, they're still fighting the Civil War now. And, yeah, they're still in it. And I always thought, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, they're still in it. <laughs> And that was a, and it also made me worry about what they're teaching now. If they all were war between the states. And so with that, let me tell you one thing real quick. By the way, I'm really glad I went. It was a great experience. I was outnumbered. I could have taken on maybe four or five hundred. Maybe. But they're like five thousand. <laughs> so Vicksburg. Vicksburg was the key. It's that they had to take Vicksburg. It's on high bluffs. It's this incredible fortified city overlooking the Mississippi River. And north of, the, of Vicksburg is this swampy called the Yazoo Delta. And then there's bayous on the Louisiana side. It's almost impossible to take. Now, Halleck moved very slowly. But then, after Antietam, 
Lincoln realized he couldn't do it anymore. And he appointed Halleck the overall commander of the United States Army. And once Halleck became commander, who's now responsible for taking Vicksburg? It's back to Grant. And Grant tried everything. The first thing they tried to do is go overland, but the problem was their supply line got too long for really effective Southern cavalry. Led by this man. Nathan Bedford Forrest, former slave trader, who would be arguably one of the greatest American soldiers, the greatest cavalry leader in American history, and a truly horrible man. That just goes to show you, just because you're good at something does not mean you're a good person. Except for us, again, we're all good at everything and good people, right? Much better than the fourth period, right? The third period, have you seen the first period? We're the best. This is the best. And I've never said that to them. Never do. I would never do it. On that happy note, we have to limbo. By the way, I was not going to tell that story. <laughs>